The town of Stewart, located at the head of the Portland Canal, is British Columbia's northernmost community situated on salt water. Because of the turbulent Nass River, it has had no road link with communities to the south or to the east. Furthermore, the Stewart Cassiar area is rich in timber and mineral resources awaiting development, and the recreational possibilities are most attractive. To open up this large section of the province, it was obvious that the Nass River must be bridged, and because it was required for the development of the forest resources of the area, the British Columbia Forest Service Engineering Division was given the job. Many planning meetings were held, and an advanced design was agreed upon, so advanced indeed that its creation would have been impossible without enlisting the services of computers. On the site, a construction camp was built, and surveys for the exact positioning of the bridge piers were commenced. One of the earliest requirements was for a footbridge across the canyon in order to facilitate construction from both banks of the river simultaneously. The footbridge was of a simple suspension type, economical to build, entirely suitable for its purpose, but not quite as steady underfoot as the rocks to which it was anchored. It was also necessary before construction of the bridge itself could begin, to rig a 460-foot-long skyline across the river, which would be stout enough to carry the bridge components and other material to exactly the right position. The guy lines for this huge skyline were anchored by drilling deep into bedrock and inserting long rock bolts. Before these were tightened down, any crevices in the rock were filled with a very fluid mixture of concrete, a process called grouting. At every stage, elaborate tests were made to make absolutely certain that there would be no mishaps. The winch was rather special, since three independently operating drums were needed. Temporary A-frames, made of logs cut from the bush, had to be high enough to carry the skyline well above the level of the projected bridge deck, and one of these was located on each bank of the river. Rigging the inch and three-quarter cable involved threading the lines through a complicated system of blocks. The blocks of the carriage, in particular, were of unique construction, since the carriage had to be capable of traveling in both directions across the river and to raise and lower tremendous loads. Once the lines had been rigged on the ground, the next job was to raise them to the top of the A-frame, across the river, and of course, back to the winch. The whole system, A-frames, cables, carriage, and winch, was in effect nothing more than a gigantic tool to be used in the bridge construction and then removed when the job was completed. Apart from the carriage itself, the skyline was fitted with a yoke and a spreader bar of such a length as to be capable of picking up both sides of each span section simultaneously. With most of the preliminary work out of the way, work was begun on the building of the piers upon which the bridge would stand. It is interesting to note that because of the swiftness and turbulence of the Nass River at this point, it was impossible to put temporary bridge supports in the stream itself, and all work had to proceed from the river banks. 
holes were drilled deep into the rock and long steel rods inserted to anchor the bridge piers securely. Within the concrete forms, a maze of reinforcing rods ensure their strength and ability to withstand any kind of stress. Concrete was poured into the forms in layers, and as each layer was completed, the forms were heightened until the desired level had been reached. Since the winch operator could not see down into the canyon where the work was going on, his maneuvers were directed by walkie-talkie from a vantage point on the footbridge. Each batch of concrete was tested, and we see here that there was a four-inch slump in this batch. This testing was to ensure the consistency of the mix and to make sure that it met specifications. Since the major structural members of the bridge were being fabricated in Vancouver to exact measurements, it was most important that every distance every height of the on-site construction be checked and rechecked. The time was approaching when heavier loads would be moved into position by the skyline, and under the watchful eyes of the engineers, large concrete test blocks, equal in weight to the load of the main span, were swung across the river. Although comparatively little steel was used in the bridge's construction, connecting plates, angle brackets, and some of the truss components were of steel and were made in Vancouver. The bridge timbers are of glue lamb construction, and they too were made in the lower mainland. Logistics were carefully worked out so that material would arrive at the bridge site in the order in which it would be used. The vertical supports, called bents, were assembled on the job, with all the pieces that had traveled so many hundreds of miles fitting together like a gigantic three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Once a bent had been assembled, it was lifted to a vertical position. Then, using the skyline, the bent was lowered to position on its pier. On the west bank of the river, because of the terrain, two additional spans, 60 feet and 80 feet long, and also made of glue lamb were required. The safety of the workers was high on the list of priorities, and this was particularly so when the time came to cross the river itself. Anyone falling into the raging Nass River would have had no chance at all of survival. The glue lamb beams for the four spans, varying in length from 60 feet to nearly 100 feet, presented great difficulties in transporting them by road all the way from Vancouver. Each portion of the double vehicle could be independently steered, an absolute necessity in negotiating the winding roads, particularly from terrace northward. One feature of the Nass River Bridge is the fact that it is very unusual for a bridge of this size to use wood in any great quantity. As we have previously noted, 
This is essentially a wooden bridge with some few pieces of structural steel. As with the bents, the four beams which make up the 188 foot main span were assembled on the ground. In this case though, it would have been impossible to lift the assembled span in a position and so it was lifted slightly by the skyline and eased out over the river. One other interesting feature of the bridge design is that the bracing is underneath rather than above the deck. This bracing was essential since without it the Gulam members would have had to be of enormous size. The reasons for placing these trusses beneath the decking were twofold. One, it is safer, since unlike conventional trussing, it is not in danger of being struck by extra wide or high loads. And two, it is a slightly cheaper form of construction. Such construction is not always possible, but here the depth available between the bridge deck and high water in the river gave ample space. While there had been unforeseeable delays in the early stages of construction, the lost time was made up, and by the time the main span was moving across the river, everything was on schedule. The underslung trusses were assembled piece by piece below the main span timbers as they moved out over the river. The day came when it was possible to cross by means of the bridge itself, using planks to link up the final small gap. There are two layers of decking. This lower one is the permanent deck, and on top of it there is a running deck, which will take the wear and tear of traffic, and which will be replaced as necessary. The first snows came in October, but the work proceeded, and all deadlines were met. The British Columbia Forest Service has built many bridges, but none as large as this, and none using this particular design. The men who built the Nass River Bridge can view with pride a river conquered and a job well done.